Hello and warm greetings. Welcome to The Analyst by Vajira Men Ravi, where we would try to comprehensively analyze few articles from the Hindu and the Indian Express from the perspective of UPSC Civil Services examination. The first article relates to the India-Africa relations, especially in the context of India's Global South strategy. The second article relates to the need for expanding nuclear energy as there are growing concerns with respect to climate, emergency and energy needs. The third article relates to the majestic great Indian bustards, the threats faced by them and the need of conservation strategies. The fourth article relates to the process of public procurement and India's own platform of government e-marketplace. Finally, we would be talking about the concept of smart metering and what India needs to do to expand smart meters in India. Now, the first article relates to India-Africa relations, especially in the context of India's Global South strategy. Recently, President Draupadi Murmu, she visited Mauritius and she described Mauritius as a cherished partner and a key player in the African outreach. Now, we'll see why African continent is of prime importance to India. Now, this relates to GS2, India and its neighborhood relations. Talking about the India-Africa relations, we see that India and Africa share a rich history based upon cultural, linkages, trade and political solidarity, right? And this relation has continued to evolve even in the 21st century, right? And the domains in which the relationship has been expanding is the economic cooperation, development assistance and strategic partnership, right? Now, if we go back into the history, we'll see that there have been ancient trade links where the Indian merchants sailed to East Africa as early as 2nd BC, right? So Indian merchants used to sail to the East Africa part as early as 2nd century BC. Now, we also have got common historical linkages when it comes to anti-colonial struggle. So there were many countries in Africa and India. Both have actually played a key role in struggles against the imperialism and colonial powers. The prime example is South Africa, right? Coming to the next phase that is of non-aligned movement. Now, the non in the non-aligned movement, India played a key role by providing platforms to new independent countries of the Africa, for example, Egypt in the Cold War era. Right. So during the Cold War era, India actually took the lead and gave platforms, provided the platforms to these emerged independent countries, newly emerged independent countries. Now, if we look in the current scenario, we will see that there has been blooming economic partnerships. Now, in the year 2022 and 23, the bilateral trade, it almost touched $100 billion, according to the Ministry of Commerce and Industries. And the key products were pharmaceuticals, agricultural products, and machinery, right? So these were the key products, right? Now, coming to the development aspect part, India has been at the forefront in providing lines of credit to these African countries. Plus, we also have got technical assistance programs, right? Moreover, through the aspect of capacity building, now it must be noted that India has got primarily two programs. First is ITEC, that is Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation Program. Second is SCAP, that is Special Commonwealth Assistant for Africa Program, right? These are the two programs on the basis of which India provides capacity, does capacity building for the African countries. Now, India and Africa share strategic partnership when it comes to maritime security, counter terrorism and global governance right it must be noted that africa it figures prominently in india's saga doctrine right that is security and growth for all in the reasons right so we see that africa and india are two very strong partners now, if we talk about why India should place Africa at the heart of its Global South strategy, we need to first be aware of what India's Global South strategy is all about. See, India's Global South strategy, it advocates for a more inclusive governance, 
where transitions into multipolarity right so in india's global south strategy africa has to be at the center now the reasons are that africa has been witnessing significant growth rate of around 3.8% right moreover 60% of the population in africa is under the age of 25 years according to united nations estimates the population of africa would reach to 2.5 billion in 2050 right and this would comprise almost 26% of the global population right talking about the immense economic potential of this partnership we need to keep in mind that india crossed 98 billion dollars of investments in the year 2022 23 right and the bilateral trade was around 100 billion dollars now this is huge right then the next point is 42 african countries they are the second largest recipient of all the credit which is extended by india right next talking about the development projects india has already completed around 200 development projects in africa right now next is the role of indian social enterprises and ngos that is to promote low cost and scalable solutions for example eco friendly houses for example promoting women solar engineers right then we have got india's advocacy for the african union it must be kept in mind that african union was admitted as a permanent member in the g20 with india's aid right now two domains actually hold a lot of promise in the india africa partnership the first is the cooperation in the critical mineral sectors see there are two factors first is that africa has world's 30% of minerals right second factor is that india has been rapidly deploying solar cells and modules plus battery systems now both the solar cells and modules as well as the battery system they actually require their huge dependence on these critical minerals right talking about the i industrial revolution 4.0 which the international energy agency says says that it is the dawn of new industrial age right so it is about the artificial intelligence about supercomputing about semiconductors now all these need critical minerals right then there are two reinforcing factors complementary factors the first is that india needs to diversify its supply chain of critical minerals second is that africa would accrue profits by exploiting the value chain that is by exploiting the market right the next point is about strengthening technical capacity among the africa's workforce see india has for long committed to enhance the capacity building and skills skill development in africa right so what is needed is needed is that india should actually revamp or establish new ways so that it can enhance this capacity building mode right now india's higher education institutes can actually play a vital role in that for example these institutes can impart industry specific trainings right project management skills etc all right now while there is a strong foundation for india and africa there are actually challenges which needs to be resolved now let's look into these challenges the first is the trade imbalance see the trade between india and africa it favors india heavily right for example we have got huge exports of pharmaceuticals machinery now these dominant while african imports are very few in number right then it also leads to the perception of an unequal partnership 
if there is a trade imbalance obviously there would be a perception of unequal partnership right coming to the limited investment part see india has definitely extended lines of credit capacity building programs but when you compare it with other countries for example china it is still minuscule right china through its debt trap diplomacy it has actually gained strategic advantage vis a vis india right so what needs to be done is india actually needs to enhance investments in specific domains right talking about the capacity building eff effectiveness see there are bureaucratic delays in fund dispersal plus there is a sort of weak project management on india's part right so they actually hinder the partnership talking about the additional the other challenges there is distance and logistics see the geographical distance it actually poses logistic cultural challenges logistical challenges right for trade and other collaborative projects right talking about different regulatory environment see india has a different regulatory environment and african countries have different regulatory bureaucratic structure so that difference it hinders it hinders the business expansion right so these are the challenges now what can be the way forward see first we need to focus upon the value chains what we mean by is that we need to collaborate with african nations so that we can establish joint ventures so that we can establish processing facilities in africa which can further lead to job creations right then now the second aspect is market access improvement what we mean by is that there needs to be relaxed tariffs so that you can have more african imports right more african imports right then there is an aspect of public private partnerships what we mean by is that the private sector needs to be need to be encouraged to invest more in african countries right so that there can be more job creation right then we need to focus upon sustainable investments what we mean by is that we need to focus upon the projects for example which involve clean energy transition solar projects for example right so these are the projects sustainable investments should be there right then we need to focus upon the skill development aspect see we already have programs like itech i told right but we need to enhance we need to actually provide the african nationals with those skills we need to upskill them so that they are ready for the industrial revolution 4.0 right so we need to upskill them right through various programs also we need to provide them enhance the project management skills so that they can themselves conduct and actually operationalize a particular project okay now then there is a need of knowledge transfer knowledge transfer of what see knowledge transfer actually involves joint projects for example you have got joint research projects which involve the higher education institutes institutes of india as well as africa right then you have got technology transfer from india's research industries right then so that you can actually focus upon making africa self reliant so that ultimately you make africa self reliant now what we see is that definitely there are challenges there are challenges but we can actually foster if we resolve these challenges we can foster collaboration right and this enduring relationship between india and africa can actually be enhanced for a brighter future right now the next article relates to expanding nuclear energy as a possible climate solution so recently in brussels we had the nuclear energy summit which actually involved the participation from around 30 countries and this advocated using and expanding nuclear energy as an important solution to combat the climate change and the energy security now this actually relates to gs3 science and technology environment and climate change now if we talk about nuclear power plants see nuclear power plants are actually the facilities which use the process of nuclear fission to generate electricity right so they are these are the facilities which use the process of nuclear fission to generate electricity now what is nuclear fission see what happens in nuclear fission is that you have a neutron which is bombarded on a heavier atomic nuclei for example in this case you have got uranium 
right and it actually becomes unstable and it breaks into in this case barium and krypton along with release of huge amount of energy that energy is actually used to convert heat energy into steam and that steam is actually used to move turbines ultimately we then receive the electricity so that is a simplified procedure right now if we talk about the global nuclear power generation we see that around the world there are around 400 reactors in around 32 countries right and these nuclear power plants they actually generate 10 percent of the world's electricity if we talk about the top producers we have got the united states france china and russia right and we need to keep in mind that it is the second largest low carbon electricity after hydropower right now talking about the nuclear energy summit is it was hosted in brussels first of its kind and it is being described as one of the most high profile international meeting on nuclear energy that has ever happened right now this was organized by the iaea now what is iaea this is the international atomic energy agency now let's have some few points about the iaea so it is an intergovernmental organization right it seeks to promote the peaceful use of nuclear energy and to inhibit the use of nuclear energy for military use which actually includes the nuclear weapons right so that is the mandate of this iaea now this is an autonomous it was set up as an autonomous organization in the year 1957 right but it is and it is governed by its own treaty it is governed by its own treaty however it reports to both united nations general assembly and united nations security council right and it is headquartered in vienna austria so these are the few points about iaea right now this summit it actually happened to pitch for nuclear energy right so that it can become an important solution for global problems for example you have got the climate change for example you have got the energy needs right and build momentum for greater acceptance of nuclear energy now definitely it advocated for expansion of nuclear energy but there are apprehensions there are apprehension there are concerns which many countries have right especially after the 2011 disastrous consequence of fukushima in japan there was a meltdown right also in Zaporizhia, right, in Ukraine, because of the armed conflicts, there's, there was a meltdown of nuclear facility, right. So, definitely there are apprehensions, but IAEA has been spearheading this Atoms for Climate initiatives, where it is in partnership with other climate organizations, for example, UNFCC, is advocating for a greater role of nuclear energy right now it must be also kept in mind that at the conference of parties 28 in dubai around 20 countries pledged that they would triple their global nuclear energy installed capacity by 2050 from 2020 levels right now we'll talk about the case use of nuclear energy what are the merits which demand the expansion of nuclear energy right the first is that it is a clean source of energy with minimal carbon carbon footprints right it has been the studies have shown that the release of emissions through the nuclear power plants is actually negligible right when compared to other sources right now according to iaea even if you consider the entire life cycle which actually involves includes the reactor construction right the uranium mining right the waste disposal right even if you consider all these aspects the emission of the greenhouse gases that is around five to six grams per kilowatt of energy produced right now this is actually 100 times lower than what you the emissions are in the coal-fired electricity and it is around half the average of the solar and the wind energy right so what we mean to say is that in comparison to the coal-fired plants or the solar and the wind energy nuclear power plants have negligible 
emission of greenhouse gases. Now, according to the IAEA, nuclear power avoids around 1 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent annually, right? Also, in the last 50 years, the nuclear power plants have avoided emissions of around 70 billion tons of CO2 equivalent. Now, this is a huge quantity, right? Now, the other advantage of nuclear power plant is the perennial availability, which is not possible in case of solar or wind projects because they are time or season dependent, which is not the case with nuclear power plants, right? Moreover, these nuclear power plants are suitable for base load electricity generation, right? Which is not the case with that of solar or wind energy. Unless you have got the development of storage, battery storage capacity, right? So, for base load electricity generation, nuclear power plants are more effective than the solar or the wind energy. Now, we see that despite these advantages, why there is poor uptake of nuclear energy? Now, if you go by the data, you will see that around only 31 countries in the world, they are using nuclear energy and barely 7 countries are working towards join, joining this club, right? Which is the number is very small. Moreover, the number of operational reactors around the world, it has actually come down. So if you go by the data, so in 2003 and if you compare it with 2023, right? So the number of operational reactors has actually come down from 437 to 411, right? The number has come down. Talking about the total installed capacity, total installed nuclear generation capacity, it has only seen a marginal increase that is from 360 gigawatt in 2003 to 371 gigawatt in 2023, right? Just see this graph. So in 2003, it was around 360 and in 2023, it's just, it has just crossed 370 gigawatt, right? Moreover, the nuclear energy it shares, the share of the nuclear energy is less than 10%. See, it is less than 10% in the overall global electricity generation, right? And it has been actually decreasing, right? The share of nuclear energy has been decreasing, right? Now, why? See, now the reasons of the poor uptake of this nuclear energy is first the safety concerns. There is a fear of nuclear meltdown, right? There's a fear of nuclear meltdown as we witness in Fukushima or Zaporozhia, right? Moreover, it's not just about the safety concerns. We need to understand that these nuclear power plants, they are highly cost intensive because they require huge investments and technology, which only few countries possess, right? Next, these projects have high gestation periods of around a decade. So for those countries who want to quickly ramp up their electricity production, they cannot go for this route of nuclear power plants, right? Moreover, these nuclear power plants, they operate under variety of regulations and constraints. For example, you have got the IAEA supervision regulations, right? So there are a lot of restrictions on these nuclear power plants so that they're not used for producing weapon grade uranium, right? So they're not used for the weapon grade uranium. Now, see, the point is that the technological development which have happened in the last one or two decades in the solar and the wind sector, those have not happened in the nuclear energy sector, right? Not happened in nuclear energy sector, right? That is the reason the cost of solar and the wind energy that has gone down. But when you compare it with the nuclear energy, the cost of the nuclear energy has not come down, right? Because substantive technological development have not taken place. For example, you have got small modular reactors, SMEs, SMRs, right? Very less research has been done for small modular reactors, right? Thus, what we see is that because of all these constraints, nuclear energy still remains the less preferred option for these countries, right? Now, what has been India's position on the nuclear energy? See, India has around 23 operational nuclear reactors and it has a combined electricity, installed electricity generation capacity of 7.5 gigawatts, right? 10 more reactors are under the construction phase and the share of the nuclear energy in the 
overall energy basket electricity generation that is of 3.1 percent it must be kept in mind that india was not a part of the 20 countries which actually pledged to triple the global nuclear installed capacity by 2050 right india was not a part of it however in india has enthusiastically participated in this nuclear energy summit in brussels where the department of where the secretary of the department of uh, atomic energy said that the nuclear energy can provide country long term energy security in a sustainable manner right therefore india has been putting its efforts to triple its current nuclear power capacity by 2030 right now what should be the way forward for using nuclear power the first is international collaboration and the first aspect in the international collaboration is for promoting the best practices in nuclear safety, waste management, non-proliferation, right? For example, and then you have technology development. So in these domains, there needs to be the promotion of the best practices. Second aspect is that there needs to be sharing of knowledge and resources to accelerate the advancement in nuclear energy. There needs to be constant sharing of knowledge and resources talking about the innovation and research the funding of research and development of advanced nuclear technologies for example these small modular reactors right or we have got next generation reactors needs to be improved right so that we can focus upon the safety efficiency and cost effectiveness of these nuclear power plants right then there has to be focus upon the public acceptance that is there needs to be open information education and communication campaigns to address the public concerns public concerns with respect to the safety the waste disposal and transparency in the operations of the nuclear power plant okay now we also need to engage with the communities with different communities and stakeholders right so that we can build public trust that is what is needed right then we need to also focus upon balancing the costs and benefits what we mean by is that we need to consider economic comparisons with other energy sources so there needs to be a comparative analysis when it comes to the other energy sources moreover the cost of mitigating climate change has to be included in this analysis then you have got what is the potential of job creation now these are the aspect which needs to which needs careful assessment right only on these basis we can thus have a more strengthened paradigm a more strengthened paradigm so that we can evaluate the concerns with respect to nuclear energy so while there are challenges, there are challenges in expanding nuclear energy, nuclear power also has a huge potential, right? So what we need to focus upon is that there needs to be greater public awareness and adequate importance should be given to the safety aspect. Only then we can actually think about expanding the nuclear energy, right? Now coming to the third article, it talks about the majestic Great Indian Bustard. Right. So recently, the Supreme Court said that it would review its decision as it ordered in 2021 to bury the underground, to bury underground all the power lines so that adequate safety can be provided to, to these great Indian bastards. However, the center said that it is practically impossible to do so. Right. Now, this concerns with GS3 biodiversity conservation. Right. Now, talking about the great Indian bastard, this is actually it's a large ostrich like bird species right and this is endemic to india right you can see in the image we have got the great indian bastard right it is also the state bird of rajasthan right if we talk about the historical distribution you can see in the map now this actually on the western part of the indian subcontinent you will see that are in in around 11 states you had the presence of the great indian bastard also in some parts of pakistan right and the stronghold was in that of the thar desert and the kutch region of gujarat also there were some portions of the deccan plateau right now if you talk about the current distribution see the current population of great indian bastard fewer than 115 individuals are left in the wild there has been drastic reduction in the population of great indian bastard 
right and it is now primarily restricted to rajasthan and some parts of gujarat right it is categorized as in the iucn red list as critically endangered right the last refuge of this bird is in the kutch region of gujarat and the thar desert of western india right over there now we'll talk about what are the threats which are actually faced by the great indian bustards the first is the habitat loss and fragmentation now if we talk about one of the aspect of the habitat loss that is the conversion of grasslands for agriculture for industries for infra projects they have been converted for agriculture for industry for infra projects and this has actually destroyed the natural habitat of the great indian bustard right then you have the problem of overgrazing now this has reduced the food availab availability and nesting cover the food availability and the nesting cover of these great indian bustards then you have got habitat fragmentation see what ha happens in habitat fragmentation is that that it results into loss of continuous grasslands so there is a development of isolated pockets right now these isolated pockets it hinders the movement between the breeding and the feeding grounds so once you have got isolated pockets it results into the hindering the movement hinders between the breeding and the you have got the feeding grounds right now next is the collision with the power lines so according to a recent study by the wildlife institute of india it says that in region in in a region of around 4200 square kilometers of the desert national park right annually every year around 84000 birds they die because of the collisions with the power lines right? that is a huge number of multiple species right so the high tension networks which is because of the evacuation of power from solar and wind projects so and this network of high tension network has been increasing right which poses a grave danger to these birds right moreover the great indian bustards have a poor frontal vision what we mean by is that they have limited forward vision and this makes them susceptible to collision right then you have got high speed collision see these birds generally fly with high speeds and this increases the severity of collisions right data suggest uh, according to the data 15% of the annual great indian bustard mo mortality is because of the collision with the power lines right next we have got the hunting and poaching now we know that that hunting is illegal however these birds are regularly hunted for meat and sports right now this is a grave concern then we have got other additional causes first is the disturbance due to human activity due to infrastructure development so it disturbs the breeding and nesting behavior of these birds then we have got the pesticide use in agriculture so it harms the pesticide use in agriculture it harms the great indian bustards prey right impacting their food source right then we have got climate change so the extreme weather events and the changes in the rainfall both these factors have contributed to the habitat loss and loss of food right now these are the reasons which have actually led to a huge decline in the great indian bustards population now what are the what is a way forward for the conservation the first is that there needs to be habitat protection and restoration we need to identify and protect the existing breeding grounds how we can do through sanctuaries wildlife corridors right second we need to restore these degraded grasslands by promoting native vegetation right by controlling overgrazing right then we have got power line mitigation strategies we need to install the underground power lines so that we can avert the collision of these birds with the power lines right moreover the existing overhead power lines should be equipped with bird diverters now what these bird diverters do is that it improves the visibility for birds 
for these birds right next we need to engage with the community we need to have awareness programs we need to educate the local community for the importance of conservation of these birds right then we need to focus upon encouraging those livelihood options which are compatible with bustard conservation right those livelihood opportunities should be promoted which are in sync with bustard con conservation right finally we need to focus upon the research and monitoring part that is we need to conduct regular research on understanding the bustards behavior on their habitat use okay on their the the threats faced by them right there needs to be constant regular research moreover there needs to be regular monitoring of the bustard population so that effective conservation strategies can be put in place right so what we see is that because of all these cumulative threats it has resulted into a drastic decline in the population of these great indian bustards however if these steps are followed in letter and spirit we can actually address this declining population and again the number of great indian bustards can be regained to sustainable levels right now the next article is about the government e marketplace so recently the government e marketplace has said that it plans to seek the center's approval in order to enable the work contract through this portal for the construction and building projects right so that it can be a platform where a transparent monitoring mechanism can be set up to assess the progress of such contracts now we'll see what public procurement is all about what gem the, the government e marketplace is all about now this concerns with the gs2 the governance part and gs3 that is the resource mobilization right now what is public procurement see public procurement is a process where the government and the state owned enterprises they actually acquire goods and services to fulfill their public functions for example an office a government office may need a uh, desks and chairs right for example a hospital a government hospital may need medical supplies so this is done through the public procurement process now every public procurement process has got three steps the first is to solicit to solicit bids from qualified vendors or suppliers right that is the first step to solicit to call for the bids for from the qualified vendors and suppliers second is to evaluate these options right to eva evaluate all the options available finally the third step is about awarding contact con contracts in a fair and transparent manner right these are the three steps in a public procurement process now if we talk about the government e marketplace now this is an online platform which serves as india's public procurement platform right so government e marketplace it serves as india's online public procurement platform now this was launched in 2016 this was launched in 2016 with the support from the national e governance division right now this platform its objective is the objective is to create an open and transparent procurement platform right the objective of the gem is to create an open and transparent procurement platform right so the gem special purpose vehicle this is a 100% government owned enterprise not for profit and it comes under the ministry of commerce and industries right now this gem which is a paperless contactless and cashless mechanism this actually replaced the directorate journal on supplies and disposals right it replaced dgsg in 2016 right next the gem platform it focuses specially on the msmes that is micro small and medium enterprises right it focuses upon the msmes and according to the portal itself almost 68% of the sellers on gem are micro small and medium enterprises now that is a huge number it also thus provides a level playing field right 
and also promotes competition right now according to the data through the gem portal the gross merchant merchandise value of procurement it has crossed the 4 lakh crore rupees 4 lakh crore mark right and this amount was actually around 2.1 lakh crores in 2022 23 right now this is a huge number now as we saw the gem is planning to include the work contracts for construction and building purposes right so that you can have a more robust monitoring mechanism so that you can also assess the growth of the project right now what are the benefits of this using the uh, government e marketplace the first is transparency and accountability see what has happened is that these this online platform it actually promotes transparency and it reduces the chances of corruption why because there is no inter human intervention right the whole process is electronic moreover we have got benefit in, in the form of efficiency and cost savings how see this gem it streamlines the process thus leads to faster procurement thus leaving leading to cost savings for the government right next we have got wide wider range of products and supplier base see almost everything is available on the gm portal for the government right starting from the critical defense supplies then if you have if you want to a service of chartering planes right also election related material so all these goods and services can be provided through the gm portal next you have a wider supplier base see you have also incorporated the msmes right so the supplier base has actually increased and that has resulted into better pricing of these goods and services next is ease of doing business see the whole process has simplified the transactions for both the government as well as suppliers right so it has actually enhanced strengthened the process for both the government as well as the suppliers right however there are challenges the challenges remain first is the digital divide see there is limited access to internet right and this limited access it may hinder the participation of potential sellers especially in rural areas right then you have got capacity building constant capacity building training has to be given to the government officials and suppliers because see the process is electronic right so constant skills need to be imparted to the government officials as well as the suppliers right next is dispute resolution mechanisms see there needs to be robust dispute resolution mechanisms for resolving the disputes between the buyers that is the government and the sellers right so what we see is overall the government e marketplace it is a significant initiative and it has actually reformed public procurement by actually instilling transparency efficiency and wider participation however these challenges need to be resolved so that we can achieve better value for public money see ultimately it is public money right so if these measures are taken we can have better value for the public money so the next article is about the concept of smart meters so re recently according to a study it was found that the government's aim to install around 25 crores that is around 250 million smart meters by 2025 is unlikely to be met right on account of slow progress in the implementation now we will see what smart meters are right now this concerns with gs3 science and technology and infrastructure right now what are smart meters see smart meters are electronic advanced electronic meters they track the consumption of electricity in real time right that is they go beyond that of traditional way and they record the electricity consumption on a real time basis right now they have a sort of a range of functionalities first is as i told the real time data now this data is it gives more accurate billing right as the actual consumption is being tracked second is there is a two way communication in these smart meters what we mean is that 
unlike the traditional meters the smart meters connects with the power utility and thus it enables data collection the power utility can actually collect the data of how their the electricity is being consumed right then you have got the prepaid option also available in smart meters now this helps it actually empowers consumers to manage their electricity consumption it empowers them right then you have got power outages detection these smart meters they instantly detect power outages and they are in a better position to convey that information to the power utilities right so if they can convey that information you can have a faster resolution of the electricity outages right then the data which is gathered through these smart meters it is used for analysis analysis for the consumption patterns theek hai we can actually detect the areas of high power loss right we can also optimize the grid management we can also optimize the grid management right so th through these uh, data analysis we can do the following aspects we can cater to the following aspects now if we talk about the current status in india india has set a ambitious target as we, as we just saw that india actually made a target to install 250 million smart meters by 2025 right however the progress is not up to the mark so as of december 2023 as of december 2023 around 8 million that is around 80 lakhs smart meters have only been installed right so that is a small number in comparison to 250 million right now the deployment agencies who are the agencies responsible for this we have got the eesl energy efficiency services limited and the states power discoms who have been interested for installing these smart meters so if we talk about the challenges of installing smart meters the first is the cost of implementation itself see the cost of the upfront cost of installing these smart meters is very high now we know that the power discoms in india they are already reeling under financial burden now if you add this cost of installing these smart meters they would aggravate it would aggravate the financial aspect then you have the concern with respect to the data security and privacy see as i already told that this smart meters it actually collects huge information about the consumption pattern now this might compromise the data security aspect it might compromise the data security because it might infringe people's right to privacy right then you have got consumer awareness see there is a very limited awareness when it comes to the benefits of these smart meters moreover people are unaware of how to actually use the data generated right so people need to be made aware so that there is a wider acceptance right so we understand that the smart meters they hold immense potential for india's power sector right to transform india's power sector especially when we see that there is a there has been a rapid expansion of the renewables right then by addressing these challenges and ensuring the smooth implementation and fostering consumer education these smart meters can actually usher in an era of more efficient power distribution more efficient power distribution more transparency right and ultimately empowered consumers right thus we need to focus upon the strategies so that we can make the installation of the smart meters more robust right thank you